Welcome to a cult of personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. In episode number 206, I'm absolutely thrilled to bring you an interview with Freemason, occultist, and author Jamie Paul Lamb. But first, I want to take a moment to wish all of you a blessed winter solstice, joyous Yule, a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and a Happy New Year. May the light also be born again in your own hearts. The Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to chamberofreflection.com, our membership site, who aids us in the cause of informed, authentic, and accessible interviews about Western esotericism. Thank you. Because of your support, we're able to bring you recordings of this caliber and many more to come. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com I want to take a moment to announce that my own book, tentatively titled Celestial Intelligences, Angelology, Kabbalah, and Gnosis, Giovanni Pico del Mirandola's Quest for the Perennial Philosophy by Greg Kaminsky and typeset and illustrated by Joseph Uccello is scheduled for release by Anathema Publishing Limited in 2021. I am very excited to be working with Gabriel and Anathema Publishing along with my friend, the talented artist Joseph Uccello to publish my extensive research into Pico's syncretic mysticism. More to come on this book in 2021. Now, a word about one of our sponsors. I support the work of Phoenix Aurelius by purchasing his alchemical products and services. I believe in them, and they work for me. They're effective. Now, you can do the same and help support a Cult of Personality podcast at the same time when you go to phoenixaurelius.org slash question mark ref equal sign a cult of personality or you can just click Phoenix's logo on the side of the Occult of Personality website at occultofpersonality.net and make a purchase. Again, that helps out Phoenix, and that helps out me. And uh, if you can do both at the same time, why not? So we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Now, in episode number 206, an interview with Freemason and author Jamie Paul Lamb about his most recent book, Approaching the Middle Chamber, the Seven Liberal Arts in Freemasonry, and the Western Esoteric Tradition. You can find Jamie Paul Lamb online at www.jamiepaullamb.com. That's www.jaimepaullamb.com. Now, I really, really loved Jamie Paul Lamb's book, Approaching the Middle Chamber. For me, this was the 
ideal book that I've been seeking since before I even considered submitting an application to my local lodge. And the first 20 minutes or so of this interview is me praising Lamb's work to the moon and back, so you know that this book is worth your time, whether you're a Freemason or not. Anyone interested in the symbolism, study, and practice of any aspect of Western esotericism will appreciate this fine volume. I was highly impressed by Lamb's penetrating insights and extensive sourcing. So I highly recommend approaching the Middle Chamber. If you enjoy listening to this show, get this book right away. You'll be glad you did. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgerinos. And the outro music is In the Middle by Bait. Jamie Paul Lamb, I want to welcome you to Occult of Personality podcast. It's really a pleasure to speak with you. I've been following your work for quite a while now, and I'm really excited to speak with you. So thanks for coming on. Likewise, Greg. It's my pleasure. and. Um really happy to be here. Excellent. Um, so for people who aren't already familiar with you and your work, maybe you could uh, just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and how you became interested in all of this um, esoteric stuff. I'd say um, probably goes back about uh, maybe about 15 years ago, I sort of had a crisis of faith, I suppose. And that was really the impetus to, you know, Freemasonry and investigating the occult and astrology and tarot really came out of that. So it was sort of precipitated by reading I was doing at the time. I had grown up Catholic. I had gotten chrismated Greek Orthodox to, to marry my wife and, it just things just sort of came to a head and the whole structure just pulled down. I had been reading a lot of uh, Kierkegaard and misunderstanding some Nietzsche at the time and and Sartre and things like that. So a lot of this heady stuff just kind of led to my own microcosmic humanistic period, I suppose, you know, where it just like the the church just fell apart for me or or my inner church kind of did, I guess, so to speak. And yeah. that that kind of led me to uh, investigate Freemasonry, um, understanding that to be sort of a nice foundation upon mm-hmm. which to build, you know. And uh, I really took to that. That was about not quite 10 years ago. Uh, I joined Freemasonry. And then you know, instantly I gravitated towards the more kind of esoteric current within the craft. And while not, you know, avoiding the more moral and ethical precepts and and things and the standard work of the craft, I believe that, you know, just as an aside, I believe that uh, um, the three degrees and our allegory really contain all of the teachings of Freemasonry. Everything else I I view as supplementary or as commentary, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd uh, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, it just seems it's so experiential and it's so, um, it can be so moving and it's a truly uh, initiatic experience, you know, and if, if we allow it to be. And I didn't read ahead or anything, you know, I, I I wanted to really have as visceral an experience as possible. And, and I got that, I got good, solid blue lodge work, you know, and back East, this was back in Connecticut where I grew up. And, um, and then I just kind of built on that. I did York, right. I did Scottish, right. Uh, I was kind of unfulfilled going down both of those paths, but I ended up, uh, in time, uh, joining the Rosicrucian College, SRICF. Mm-hmm. And that I found to be, a, you know, kind of my wheelhouse. You know, I had found my tribe within 
the craft sort of, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and that really spoke to me and, and to my reading and development over those, you know, first five years, let's say. And, um, you know, all the while I was kind of, and this leads to the books, you know, the, um, all the while I was sort of, uh, writing, you know, just because it helps me to make sense of things, you know, how like, uh, you get an idea and you don't have it quite locked down in your mind. I find it easier to either talk to somebody about it and explain it to them as if I were, you know, just trying to teach them about it or write it, you know, as if it were, you know, a presentation or something like that, which just really helps to get these sort of neonate underdeveloped ideas more crystallized, you know? So I've been writing. That's super insightful. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. So I've been writing since day one in the craft. I mean, even from before I knew anything about anything I was writing, you know, and, uh, so eventually that led to myth, magic and masonry in 2018, which is really, it's kind of four essays that I threaded together with the, uh, it's, it, there's an essay on solar and astrological symbolism on Mithraism as an exemplar of the mystery traditions. Um, there's one on ceremonial magic and another one on myth magic or on, um, classical mythology. So I took those four and I kind of threaded them together with the narrative of the, uh, the Anno Lucas and the Taurian age as, so that was sort of my theoretical perspective was Mm -hmm. the Anno Lucas and the Taurian age are the vantage point from which to survey the symbolism of these four things and how they relate to each other. So that was kind of, I guess you could say my thesis for that book. And then you know, a couple of years go by, I noticed that, uh, well, like we all notice, I'm sure when you go through the fellow craft degree, you get this amazing lecture, the middle chamber lecture, which, uh, you know, starts on the, the porch of King Solomon's temple. You pass through the pillars. You, you find this winding staircase of three consisting of flights of three, five and seven, uh, steps. And then finally up to the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. And at each sort of point in that journey, there's, for your readers who don't know, uh, there's sort of a a piece of the lecture corresponding to each of those points. And the big, the largest part, I think, being the seven liberal arts and sciences, which we find on the course of seven steps on that step on that allegorical or symbolic staircase. And I found that after being passed, uh, I was none the wiser about these, uh, these seven liberal arts, you know, and how, how they sort of pertain to our work, you know, and years go by. And I think, how come we never went back to that? And I can't really find anything in our literature. Sure. There are things outside of the sort of, um, corpus of masonic literature but i didn't really find one place where there was any depth on the the contents of that fellow craft lecture so i found this to be a huge vacancy in in our work you know in our in our supplementary or or you know the commentary on the craft so i decided okay I had already been writing about that stuff and I had already had probably, you know, whatever, 20,000 words or something on it. So then I figured, okay, I'll just flesh this out. And then, you know, 138,000 words later, (laughs) uh, approaching the middle chamber was written. Yeah. We were very fortunate that you, uh, put that time and energy into it for sure. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, well, firstly, I want to say, although I haven't finished the book yet, it is incredibly well written. It is profound. There's a lot of insights that you point out. And 
it's just, it was really a joy to read it. Um, so thank you for that. I, you know, it's just wonderful to encounter a book like this. Um, and as an aside, you know, before we get into the book itself, I'm just curious, uh, where you went to school, like where you learned to think the way you think, um, because it's clearly not typical. I, you know, uh, I guess sort of embarrassingly, uh, I got a GED. You know, I, I grew up in a burnt out industrial city in Connecticut on the, uh, on Long Island Sound. Uh, I was destined to be a tool and die worker, uh, in factories in a, in, uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. By the time I sort of came of age, uh, it was time to, you know, like, like everybody around me, time to drop out of school and start working. And, uh, I found that, um, there was no work, you know? So I, I took a, literally a Jack Kerouac book and a duffel bag. And I took what money I had and I took a flight to Phoenix, Arizona, pretty much sight unseen and, uh, kind of just started my life out here for a while and then bounced around all over the country, just trying to, you know, for the better part of 20 years, just, uh, reading, learning and having experiences with people and some of it good, some of it bad, but none of it really regretful. So no, I'm an autodidact, I guess you would say. And I, I have no, um, no, uh, formal academic training. So you're just fucking badass, apparently. I think I'm a badass. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, (laughs) It's impressive because your analysis, the way you make your arguments, the way you write and source things, like when I'm reading your book, like aside from the subject matter itself, like the way you're writing, the style, your language, structure, like this is... And, you know, I hope I'm not going overboard. I'm really not trying to belabor this, but, you know, this would have been, you know, a, you know, grade A work at Harvard. So you should be really proud of yourself, I think. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I think some of it, maybe the wordiness, I I was hoping to not go into like, Arthur Edward Waite territory with these circular sort of um, impenetrable kind of uh, sentences and things. But, uh, you know, I think some of that might come from, I had spent a few years uh, reading a lot of critical theory, mm-hmm. Baudrillard and um, Guy Debord and people, French critical theory. And I don't know how I found that or what I was trying to do. I think I was mixed up in the art scene at the time or something. And that was kind of par for the course along with Kierkegaard and things. So I was reading some of that stuff and, uh, and, and that's actually where I get, um, part of my perspective is that these guys like Guy Debord and Baudrillard, I think they established this critical perspective, a theory, a critical theory, right? They, they establish this perspective and then they sort of zoom in on the subject. Mm. It seems there's a certain way that these guys sort of get their thing together. And, and I, I really absorb that. And I like that, uh, you know, the, the analogous sort of thinking this, uh, you know, and, and mashing up to sort of a thesis and an antithesis, you know, and this sort of a dialectical thing, you know, and I think that some of my, maybe all the way through a lot of my stuff has that sort of comparison, which fits well with hermeticism, I think, because of course we have this, 
this analogous relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm. And for me, I felt like I had already had the mechanism for that on deck before I even approached Freemasonry and, and the occult, you know, is, is, uh, I felt like I was intellectually set up for that or primed for that by what I had read previously, which was just a stroke of luck, really. Yeah, that's really interesting. Really interesting. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah. So your book, again, Approaching the Middle Chamber, The Seven Liberal Arts and Freemasonry in the Western Esoteric Tradition, I think this is really, really interesting book. It's well written, as I said. And I agree with you. I, I feel like, you know, we do get this amazing lecture in the second degree. And there's definitely one of the highlights, no doubt about it. And you're right. It's like, it just gets lip service on some level and the lip service it gets is just freaking fantastic. So I'm not trying to right. disparage that in any way, shape or form, but you're right. I, I wanted to know more about it. I'm like, well, how do these things all fit in and is there more to it? And it seems to be because there's such a huge emphasis on the symbolism and the way it relates to these arts and disciplines, if you will. Um, so I'd have to say, you know, yours is really the first book that I've encountered that, that took these ideas and like took it all the way, I guess. I mean, maybe there's further to go, but I, I, I don't see that. Like you, you, you explored things like connections with the numerology uh, you're connecting like Masonic symbolism and the lectures to Kabbalah and Hermeticism and ceremonial magic and astrology and and probably mythology and a few other things going on there, depending on the specific symbol. But um, it, it's extensive. Uh, Again, you you said you were trying to sort of educate yourself on this topic, and this is sort of the way you decided to approach it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, having an interest in the occult and Western esotericism in general, I, I felt that, you know, and having established that that was sort of my brand or whatever with myth, magic, and masonry, I felt like, okay, this is – I could just write a pretty dry – seven liberal arts book, you know, and just go through them, historical context, et cetera, and just kind of, kind of get, you know, do a Wikipedia type of thing all in one place, you know, just an essay on each of them. I, I could have done that very dry. And had I done that, I think the book would probably go canonical, you know, like maybe even in lodges, they would hand the book to their fellow crafts the night they're passed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as it stands, uh, my theoretical perspective is is decidedly a cult, you know. So I, I'm deeply involved in uh, hermetic magic, astrology, um, tarot. You know, it's part of my personal practice. I do it all day long, you know, uh, when I'm not at my day job. But it's 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 a part of my experience of the world. You know, th that's the best way I could say it. It really is sort of these are the media by which I sort of uh, have my experiences moving in the world in a lot of ways. And uh, th and it's how I find meaning and it's how I invest my experiences and life's f f noumena and phenomena with meaning. You know, it's how I enrich life through the occult. You know, it's really sort of um, been instrumental. Like I said, I had that crisis. I had a crisis years ago and I had to figure out um, – how to assemble and integrate 
and how to assemble a life, you know, and upon what foundation. And um, so, yeah, anyway, I established that, that Western esotericism and Freemasonry and everything those entail as sort of my foundation. So now when I write, when I wrote uh, Approaching the Middle Chamber, I could have just gone the straight route and done a seven liberal arts book, but it's my experience. It's my sort of brand. It's the way I understand the world. And this is what came out. Now, hopefully um, I know that there will be some lodges and some individual Masons who will find value in that. And I also know conversely that there will be some who will say, uh, I don't screw around with tarot cards and astrology, which is totally fine. You know, I mean, uh, but would it be nice to see, um, my contribution sort of, uh, um, utilized, you know, and, and help, the next mason or or whoever i mean it doesn't even it's not necessarily a masonic book per se i don't i mean any anyone interested in the subject matter should be able to get into it i mean it's not i mean would you say from what you read that it's strictly you know this is for freemasons only there's no secrets in there there's no signs grips words you know there's nothing that that's even master mason uh level you know i mean no i i think this, this is a book for Anyone who's interested in any aspect of Western esotericism, whether it's practicing it or the historical aspects or the symbolism uh, or the way that these correspondences can be traced through different systems and traditions, uh, the entirety of it is fascinating. And I absolutely believe that even if someone were not a Mason, if they were interested in this material, this book would be an absolute treasure. Like it would be a literal chest of gems. <laughs> well, yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, a, a couple years went into it, a lot of research, a lot of time, a lot of knocking my head against the wall. And, you know, you mentioned, um, uh, hopefully you found the original observations in there. And it sounds like you did. And I would not have written a book had there not been some contribution, some original contribution to Masonic thought or esoteric thought in general. Mm -hmm. If there were, if I didn't feel like I was adding something, I wouldn't have written a book. I wouldn't have written myth, magic and Masonry, you know, but I think both of these books and particularly approaching the middle chamber has probably there are probably upwards of a hundred observations that you're not going to find anywhere. And I'm, I'm not trying to be a salesperson right here. No, just no, I, I completely agree. There's stuff I found in there that was shocking to be quite honest with you. And it, it the, th well, we'll get into it later in the interview, believe me, but you, it, it's it like even, alludes to even further secrets that are really go to the heart of esotericism like beyond any specific tradition so yeah. it, it you know to like right to the heart of mysticism and um so i have a lot of questions for you around that but again like that it would be jumping the gun to get right to that um, mm -hmm, right. but yeah, you're right. You, you, what, the research you've done clearly is very in depth. Um, and you're right. It's insightful. And I appreciate the fact that you're, you're bringing forth knowledge that, uh, I've not seen before in print, um, and some connections that I, you know, are clearly evident when you point them out, but I'd never even thought about them before um, or read them anywhere or heard anyone talk about. So it seems quite original, you know, so you deserve a lot of credit. The, and that's what's always and I appreciate that. And that's what's always excited me about, you know, like I liken it to things like um, 
Um, you know how you, uh, mon- it's mundane, but uh, the sixth sense, I think it was called, with Bruce Willis, mm-hmm. where you find out, spoiler alert, you find out the guy's dead about 75% of the way into the film. You find out the guy's been dead the whole time. Um, And I really had no idea that that was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, like his ring falls off and I'm like, oh, my God, he's been dead this whole time. You know, and for me, those those moments of revelation, those little uh, explosion of synapses, you know, that kind of uh, just like a train switching yard where it's just like, nope, you're on this track now. Yeah, You know, and that sort of, uh, that sort of thing, like I found value in, in, um, Robert Hewitt Brown, his stellar theology and Masonic astronomy. Yeah, Uh, that was, yeah, that was one of those ones where, and I read that right after I was raised. That was one of the first books I read after I was raised and I had to put it down and like pace back and forth. I was so Mm -hmm. like just blown away and then another one more recently was uh pd newman's alchemically stoned oh yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah i had no idea i mean i had no idea about this stuff and then to kind of it is i'm not going to give away his thesis right now you should read definitely read the book for your viewers you know but uh but um yeah there it was just this this shocking perspective and it's those sorts of those sort of uh kind of paradigm shifting moments where it's like uh that's what i value you know but and i'd say i'd say so among those maybe hundred original observations there are probably there are probably five in there that are pretty big you know oh yeah yeah, I would agree. So, and just for yeah. the listeners, uh, I just want to mention uh, we did have P.D. Newman on the show to discuss his book, Alchemically Stoned, and we went into depth about his thesis. Uh, so if people want to go back and check that out, if you want to re-listen or haven't heard it, it's a pretty good conversation, as you allude to uh, about his book. Um yeah, I have to say, and, and you know, not to compare, but I'm gonna anyway. Mm. Yours was far more shocking to me. The things wow. you're pointing out were definitely more revelatory than his thesis of his book. And that's not yeah. to say one is better than the other, but um, because they're both your really, experience with really it, really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I I I'm, I want to talk like uh, to give people a little bit of a taste of sort of what you're doing with the book, and I don't know really the best way to do that other than to say, you know, would it be possible for you to sort of walk us through one of the symbols that you analyze and just give us like some of the highlights of like say the the two the two pillars and and like some of the symbolism and the meaning and and the connections that you draw forth from it for sure yeah so with with the pillars let's just take that cuz you brought it up uh you know there there's some well traveled territory. A lot of people write about the pillars. It seems like an easy subject to write about. You know, somebody's going to, oh, you got to do a paper for education night. Why not take the pillars? You know, it's uh, King Solomon's temple. There's some nice biblical references to fall back on, and you could just flesh out 2,000 words in probably a night. Um, right. So, so it's been traveled, right? But there's, I've found that there's a lot going on there. I mean, um, a lot of, you know, like one thing that doesn't really get brought up is, is that they were, they're described as being not non load bearing at some point, you know, that they're, they're not holding up any sort of structure. They're not, uh, uh, they're not holding up a roof of any kind, 
you know, and I thought that was significant and and I haven't heard that really touched on too much. Uh, And my wife and I about four or five years ago went to Egypt all up and down the Nile. And we saw, we saw so many, I was templed out, you know, we saw so many temples and uh, some of them still had one or two of the obelisks in front of the pylons before the Mm -hmm. temple. Right. And, uh, of course the obelisks are non-load bearing. They're there. I think they're there as a proof of the builder's work in some sense. And here's kind of what I mean by that is, uh, if you were to use them as nomons to trace what, what are called analamatas on the ground, uh, the the apparent path of the sun as as sort of traced by these the points of the obelisks on the ground um, it would make like a figure eight almost a almost sort of a lemnus gate shape uh, maybe even where the lemnus gate comes from these analamata and um, if you were to have two pillars they would cross at a certain point. There's some astro sort of physics about this, but you'd be able to um, orient your temple. And that's significant, the word itself, orient or orientation. It, ha- it has the East built into it, you know, the, the very word. So you would be able to orient your temple based on either the solstices or the equinoxes. And from then, you would use, you would, you would mark that point, delineate that point, and then you would um, have a right angle come off of it perpendicularly. And you would, you would use, you know, one way you could do that would be a three, four, five triangle or a Pythagorean triangle, which of course is going to make uh, a right angle off of your, off of the the line that you have already described based on either the equinoxes or the solstices and these two standing pillars. So that obelisks were pointy on top kind of almost leads me to think that they may have been nomons anyway. So bringing this back to the pillars of King Solomon's temple, these were non-load bearing. The Jews had, you know, they were in Egypt, you know, uh, there's a lot of places, uh, don't ask me exactly where right now because I won't be able to summon that. But there are places where they talk about King Solomon's temple and it's sort of uh, – it's uh, it it's being like a uh, – an displaying elements of Egyptian temples, let's say. So these two non-load-bearing pillars uh, – kind of could have been proofs of the builder's work you know else they else they would be torn down right because what do you need two non-load bearing pillars another thing that i brought up regarding the pillars was uh their their position so that you have one in the north and one in the south now as we know from the description of king solomon's temple in the bible It is, and I think it's in Chronicles or One Kings. Um, If you were knocking on the door of King Solomon's temple, you would have had your back to the rising sun. So the sun rises, penetrates between the two pillars through the portal and into the Sanctum Sanctorum, a la Egyptian temples, many of them, uh, and their orientation to the east. So. The fact that a Masonic temple is the inverse of that, where it's actually uh, the worshipful master is in the east, the pillars are are in the west. It's it's the exact opposite orientation. So uh, I think I wrote something about the that being a possible allusion to the Gnostic heresy that that the Mason is given the tools with which to um, improve himself, to become a better man and to to true his ashlar that it might fit for that eternal temple in the heavens. You know, another macrocosmic scale 
of the terrestrial temple. So, um, yeah, I just reeled off on a lot of that sort of stuff. I mean, of course, getting into your, your standard sort of Lamech story about his, you know, these, these antediluvian preservation of, uh, existing knowledge in the two pillars, uh, one of marble and one of brass or, of Seth and Hermes. And, oh, and I also get into, regarding the pillars, I, I, I get into network lily work and pomegranates, which adorn the capitals of Masonic pillars. And, um, I sort of minutely get into each, each of those three. Let's do pomegranates, for example. Um, I apply a mythological interpretive lens on that and bring up how Adonis's spilled blood is said to be the first place from from whence uh, the pomegranates sprouted. You know, the pomegranate tree or bush or mm. whatever pomegranates grow on, and uh, and also, of course, the the rape of Persephone and her ascent from the underworld and how she ate three or six or some number of pomegranates, depending on the source. And, uh, was required to spend a third or half of the year in Hades. So sort of just mythologically buttressing the idea of pomegranates. So when we see those, so when the fellow craft sees those or thinks about those in the lecture, maybe he's a senior deacon and he's learning the middle chamber lecture. He can think about these pomegranates and not only think about their denoting plenty due to the exuberance of their seeds, but also think about uh, Adonis and Persephone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like the way you even get into like the gematria of the names of pillars and different values that could be related and describing them. And obviously the tarot imagery. So, yeah, it's really pretty awesome. So, for people who are interested in this sort of thing, this is like, uh, I don't know what you compare it to, you know, some sort of sumptuous feast. Um, I guess one of the things I, I started wondering about as I was reading it is, um, did you approach this with any sort of preconception about whether or not we're sort of like, obviously there are these connections with the symbolism that are valid. But did you, do you start to wonder like, did the Masons who created this have any awareness or understanding of any of these connections or the symbolism that I'm I'm drawing out here and I'll let you answer and then, but it, you know, I have my own thoughts on it as well. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, I think that some of this, here's a good way to explain it. I believe that if Freemasonry were, were kept in the hands of, Masons who did not dig any deeper than the su relatively superficial moral and ethical um, veneer of our work. So, in other words, non-occult, non-esoteric Freemasons, if they were the custodians of the craft for 500 years, let's say, and not, and not one esoteric Freemason uh, or occultist approached any of the work. I believe that at the end of that 500 years, if the right person were to come along, they would be able to uh, suss out these sort of hidden, um, uh, the hidden significance of our work, whether that's geometrically, whether that's astronomically or astrologically. Uh, whether that's in terms of, uh, you know, any sort of occult commentary or any 
esoteric perspective. I think that somebody with those perspectives already developed would be able to uh, f- find meaning. Now, that sounds kind of arbitrary, right? Uh, that we're projecting. It implies maybe that we are projecting meaning onto this, um, the tabula rasa that is Freemasonry in this model, right? Um, but I, but I think that, uh, there's something to be said for, uh, the idea of maybe the collective unconscious being at play here. You know, uh, on every con, on every continent, beavers know how to make a dam. You know, uh, they don't have to tell each other how to do that. You know, the, it's kind of vestigial. It's something that, or it's it's uh, inherent in their their psychic apparatus somehow. So, I think that the expression of modern Freemasonry is something that has ancient ideas, whether conscious or unconscious, and that they've been perpetuated um, out of the standardization of the system. And I don't think it's as important that... I don't think the conscious transmission has been as important as the unconscious transmission of this really occulted knowledge and these uh, motifs that sort of uh, harken back to anything you're likely to find in, in, say, Alexandria at the turn of the last millennium. You know, I I think there's a ton of that in there. There's a ton of sort of Neoplatonic ideas, some quasi-Gnostic ideas. Uh, look at the Saints John. You know, there's uh, there's just a lot going on there that uh, that though it might not have been a conscious transmission, they are there for those you know with eyes to see. I guess. Yeah, <clears throat> I appreciate that, um, and I agree. If you know. The way Freemasonry preserves itself is genius. It's, and that's the one of the reasons why I suspect that at least some of what you're um, writing about, some of these connections that are not specifically Masonic, but fall into sort of other areas of other esoteric traditions. Um, I suspect they probably knew about it um, I, because when I look at the whole thing in totality, I feel like whoever designed this was so genius that they could preserve uh, not only knowledge and information, but also specific experiences or ways of being. And it was all sort of encoded into this sort of information packet, which is, you know, lectures and ritual and, you know, overall tradition. And you're right. um, The person preserving it doesn't have to know it really at all. They just have to practice it as it's presented, even on a superficial level. And that's enough to preserve it in totality for as long as necessary. As long as it's in use, it's always there. And then someone comes along like you and boom, it's there, you know, un- it's all there to unpack and it, and it's always been there. And that's kind of why it's sort of almost like a holographic type of thing. And that's what makes me, suspicious because like you see other examples of that sort of thing like um an example of that is like in buddhism where if you look at and i'm not trying to compare freemasonry and buddhism here i'm just saying there are aspects which i find similar um 
and this aspect of the hol- holography where any aspect of a teaching in Buddhism can lead you to the totality of the entirety of the teachings. And in Freemasonry, it's not totally dissimilar where any little piece of it and all of a sudden you're spiraling out into like a mass of mythology and symbolism and geometry and astronomy it's and it it goes on and on so my suspicion is somehow whoever designed this knew more than we knew a lot more, I think, but it's it's not clear exact, exactly when or who or you know or or what traditions they had access to specifically. But clearly, okay. I think, I mean, this uh, what the things that you draw, like some of these connections, that I just don't, I find it impossible to imagine. It's like a coincidence or. Even just a synchronicity, like it seems way more deliberate to me, but that's just my opinion and it's really not worth anything. You know, I agree though. And I, and I love that you bring up something that I've been more recently sort of fascinated with is the, this fractal idea, you know, and how just this piece, which is a very hermetic idea at its root anyway, this, that one little piece sort of contains uh the entirety of the work you know and th- and that it could be extrapolated from uh the minutest sort of uh fractal and i i think a good example of that is the the temple itself right so yes um how we have the we have the terrestrial temple the thing down you know the building downtown where the lodges meet right um we also have when we do our memory work when simultaneously many masons are doing memory work and you have to if i know you've done it before so you have to visualize the lodge you have to visualize the movements of the officers their circumambulations and the aspects that they make essentially and uh and so you're essentially in a very sort of um Bruno-esque way creating this uh, uh, a mental or intellectual temple. So there's another uh, f- f- fractalization. There's another hermetic plane upon which w- we engage in temple building. There's the temple of the body itself, this biological temple. There's the there's the temple as in the templum, the Latin templum, mm-hmm. uh, the ground upon which uh, the augurs would consecrate for their, you know, auspex for bird watching and uh, and watching aus auspices um uh, for divination and there's of course the astral temple you know which is an entirely different egregorical structure there is there is again the sort of the celestial temple there is the temple that is the cosmos there is the temple that is in the prima mobile uh you know beyond the spheres and in in heaven the the eternal house not made with hands etc so i think that sort of fractalization is at the very heart of freemasonry and and i believe at the heart of uh western esotericism in general yeah that reminds me too it and i think you're correct um and the story that you reminded me of kind of proves it um supposedly the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic tradition in, of Kabbalah and Judaism, was uh, shipwrecked with one of his devotees, and they find an island and you know get out of the boat, and he's like, I can't, I can't remember, I can't remember the Torah, I can't remember, I can't remember anything. He's like, Can you help me? remember something and the the guy who's with him is devotee is like aleph bet and he's like all right aleph i got it i got the whole thing that's all i needed yeah which is so kabbalistic right the rushing forth Mm -hmm. um of aleph uh another example maybe being uh in levy in eliphas levy uh i forget which book probably 
uh, dogma and ritual, but uh, he talks about the tarot being if 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 a man were stranded somewhere, I think he said in the middle of a forest or something like that, if he were stranded somewhere and the only thing that he had at his disposal was a pack of tarot cards, he would be able to um, recreate all the knowledge of the world. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think there's that, there's that aspect where we may not always recognize it, but, um, there's something about wisdom that enables this packing and unpacking and sort of this holographic sense that, you know, because it's referring to something that is beyond separation or classification, when you, you know, look at part of it, you're, you're essentially looking at the whole thing. I think that's really what they're, they're getting at yeah so it's really like yeah, the mind the mind when you look at the mind you're using the mind to look at the mind so any piece of it that you look at is automatically part of the larger whole and represents that on some greater level exactly yeah I, i'm pretty sure um uh, i'm no uh biologist but uh but our dna which is you know uh widely distributed throughout our our body i'm sure in every cell i suppose um contains the genetic code of who we are so theoretically i guess uh you know one cell could they not uh, again i'm getting into not my area of expertise but but from what i understand you could uh you know at least get that information and get uh, get an identity out of that you know and uh another sort of fractal idea the the microcosmos absolutely well jamie it's been really a pleasure to speak with you tonight and i really appreciate you know all of your insights and your extraordinary understanding and ability to analyze this material uh, it's really extraordinary and um I recommend your book to anybody. If they've enjoyed this conversation, then it's just a small taste of what you offer there. So I very much appreciate it. Yeah, I can't thank you enough for having me on, brother. It's it's uh, been really, I've me learned, too. I feel like I've learned a lot, you know, so. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. So, um, let me just stop. Thanks a lot, Greg. Here, if you can hang on a moment. So, thanks a lot, Greg. In the Chamber of Reflection, Jamie Paul Lamb and I continue in the second half of this interview. We delve into his insights regarding the number 15 and the magic square of Saturn. We talk about our impressions of the founders of Freemasonry based on what we can read and observe. Lamb discusses the wages he's been paid in terms of penetrating the hidden recesses of nature to plumb the depths of her secrets. Then we go even deeper into the implications of his work and where it leads. Listen to that exclusive recording at chamberofreflection.com or at our Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. Now, I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts and the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks, and I salute you. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Stop.
it's not so far off.